Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Glasgow Church of Christ. It's my pleasure to welcome you today. I, I'm going to keep it short today because I want to give my brother Charles uh, plenty of time to preach the word. Uh, Charles Elicu is a brother from uh, North London and he's going to be speaking to us today about increasing and abounding in love. What a fantastic uh, topic for a sermon today. Um, we're also going to have uh, Scott and Rochelle lead us in worship uh, and Andy uh, is going to bring us uh, to the foot of the cross at uh, communion. Good afternoon and welcome to our worship service today. Uh, we hope you have had a good week and we look forward to catching up with you later on in the chat. Um, but before we do anything, uh, let's go to God in prayer. Father in heaven, we love you so much and we, we come together um, united but separated in our own homes. Um, we look forward to the times when we can get together properly in person. Uh, to that end, we just ask that you guide the, the lockdown phases um, as the restrictions get lifted. And we pray that um, th that it goes the way that advisors and, and scientific people hope it will. Um, and that life can sort of resume a wee bit of normality sooner than, than we that we expect. Um, we love you so much and we just pray that your kingdom continues to advance um, even during these times that uh, as people are restricted that the gospel isn't. Um, we just pray for anyone right now that's seeking you um, that they be encouraged um, to seek you more and more um, and to make a, a decision for their lives to, to truly follow you and to, to take on your lifestyle, your culture um, to find their identity in you, Father. And we pray that each one of us um, is reminded of that daily, that, that we, are died, we have died to ourselves and we live for you. We love you so much and we give thanks to you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, we're going to sing a few songs. Um, I love you, Lord, on Zion's glorious summit um, and Agnes Day, I think that's how you say it. Um, but before we do that, I've got a little scripture here um, that Rochelle's going to read. Um, this is Psalm 26, um, 8 to 12. O oh Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Do not sweep my soul away with sinners, nor my life with bloodthirsty men, in whose hands are evil devices and whose right hands are full of bribes. But as for me, I shall walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me. My foot stands on level ground. In the great assembly, I will bless the Lord.
Good morning, everyone. I bring you greetings from the North region of the London Church. It is such a joy to be able to worship with you today. You know, I am very, very grateful for the opportunity to preach this lesson. Be it that we are uh, preaching, meeting virtually, and we long for the time when all this is over, we can really meet and hug each other. You know, we praise God so much for the amazing victories that are happening even amongst you. You know, we rejoice very much as we see so many new lives being transformed, many young people being raised up to leadership, and we see people becoming Christians. And all this 
happening in spite of all the trials that COVID-19 lockdown has brought for us. You know, I am so thankful and grateful for the leaders that you have. They are doing such a fabulous job along with the leadership team. And we thank God very much for them. You know, as a church in London, our theme this year is the acronym LOVE. Let our vision expand. And we needed that so much more even this year. Our second quarter theme is let our love grow. And we truly need such a, 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 such a theme to really help us along the way. Today's lesson is based on 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. And the title is Increase and Abound in Love. You know, we going through all that is happening in our world today. This is such an appropriate title for such a time. You know, the year 2020, uh, if you remember, started on the backdrop of Brexit. Many of us have forgotten with all the uncertainties surrounding Brexit. Then COVID-19 began with many weeks and months now of lockdown, health, economic and financial meltdown all over the world. And today, our focus have now moved from isolating to rioting. Violent protest, bitter rage and anger from racist atrocities. You know, this past week's event of the horrific death of George Floyd has so much resurrected all the racist injustice and institutional racism that many people have experienced. And so now, People are just reacting in all sorts of ways. But you see, as Christians, we are called to react in the way that is honor honorable to God. You know, love is what conquers evil. And God is calling us today to respond by following Jesus' example, not the world's way of responding on how to under lockdown and oppression to stand up against injustice and racism. We, like Jesus, must let our love grow in the midst of hostility, in the midst of bitterness, anger, and re revenge. The Thessalonian church are a great example for us in this area, and I'm so glad that we are going to be looking at it today. But just to give us a background to this church and why the letter was written, when we look at how the church was formed in Acts chapter 17, it does help us to appreciate this letter to the Thessalonians disciples and how we can learn from them to increase and abound in our love. You know, in Acts chapter 17, it is the backdrop from the uh, events of Acts 16, where Paul was being forced out of Philippi. In Philippi, Paul and Silas had gone in there, helped a few people become Christian, and before you know it, they were in trouble, and, and uh, uh, the authorities, riot began there, authorities wanted them out. They were publicly beaten. They were put in jail. But, you know, instead of licking their wounds from that, they were singing robust songs to God. And by midnight, an earthquake started which led to the jailer and his whole household becoming disciples. But by the next morning, the officials realized that uh, Paul, both Paul is a Roman citizen and they shouldn't have treated him that way. So what they decided was to then escort them out of the city, Philippi. So they left Philippi and the next closest place that they had a Jewish community was Thessalonian. And so they headed to, towards that place. Within three Sabbath days of being in uh, Thessalonica, Paul and his friends planted the church. Just three weeks they spent in Thessalonica. You know, what happened there is that a few Jews became disciples, re responded to the gospel, along with a large number of Greeks, men, and also prominent women who got baptized. The situation there was that the Jews being Jews, we're not really associating with Gentile. It was just a racist and prejudiced situation that the Jews doesn't, don't mix with the Gentiles. But now, within three weeks, these people have become now a family together, learning to love one another. But that doesn't go down well 
with everybody. So the jealous Jews stirred up the crowd and started a riot. And so the riot broke out and everywhere, everyone was consumed in it. One of the synagogue uh, leaders, uh, Jason, was actually beaten up with several of the brothers and they were dragged out into the public arena. You know, just imagine it. These are disciples who are less than three, three weeks old as a disciple. Isn't it amazing that we do have several people who have become disciples in, this, in the past three weeks here. Now imagine the whole church being young disciples, less than three weeks old, learning to join together with people they've grown up not even associating with and allowing the love of Christ to flow amongst them. And now their whole community, the Jewish ones, are really upset and staring riot and problem. But, you know, the whole thing got so intense. Paul and Silas were bundled out of Berea, uh, bundled out to Berea, a neighboring uh, uh, town. Trouble also followed Paul and, uh, over there to Berea. So they bundled Paul straight to Athens. And he was there on his own. And then that's where he even started the church in Athens. Before going over from Athens to Corinth, where he was supposed to meet Silas and Timothy. And it was there in Corinth, within two or three years later, that Tim, Timothy came back from uh, visiting the church in Thessalon uh, Thessalonica and then bringing report from what the church and how the church was doing. Paul then, with Silas and Timothy, sat down and wrote the first letter of Thessalonians with the follow-up coming six months later. So what we see really is just a church that was three weeks old and Paul, their leaders, had to leave abruptly. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, We were torn away from you just like a mother from her baby. You know, lots of emotions, hurt feelings, Therefore, Paul just wrote down, uh, uh, you know, sat down and wrote. And there were three reasons behind his writing. The first one was to commend them for trusting in God in spite of intense trials, persecution, and toxic environment. You know, they did not let their focus down. They kept their eyes on God. Secondly, he wrote to encourage them to continue loving each other. I mean, these people who have not really associated, they've all held racist view, but now they're living in harmony with one another. It's, he encouraged them to continue loving one another and then gave them more instruction about godly living. Then he closes out the, the book by reassuring them and re-instructing them about the second coming of Christ. You know, what we're going to do right now is to go and now read First Thessalonians chapter 3. But before we do that, let's go to God in prayer. Bow with me as we pray to God at this time. Our Heavenly Father, God, we are so grateful for a privilege you granted to us that in the midst of all that is going around us, you can surround us with love and peace. Thank you that in you, God, your love knows no bound, that you even love your enemy and you have called us to love those who even hate us. Thank you for sending your son to model it. I pray that today you open our hearts so that we can learn to respond to whatever situation we find ourselves, to respond the way Jesus has modeled to us. That the way of love is the way that, that really produces the ultimate fruit. Father, I really pray that every one of us will be able to see something here today, that we can be able to make changes in our own life, so that our life will reflect what you will bring you honor and glory. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's uh, please turn with me in your Bible and we'll read 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and we'll just read the whole thing and then uh, we'll just uh, then draw some practicals from it. So we read, it says, So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in God, in God's service, in spreading the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one will be unsettled by these trials. For you know quite well that we are destined for them. In fact, 
when we were with you, we kept telling you that we will be treat, we will be persecuted, and it turned out that way, as as you well know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you, and that our labor might have been in vain. But Timothy was just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we long to see you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. For now we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as our love does for you. May he strengthen your heart so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus Christ, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes with all his holy ones. You know, that is such an incredible emotion packed you know passage so encouraging to hear god uh, uh, paul having an outpouring how much they long to see them it's like they've been in a lockdown and they cannot see each other a bit of what we are experiencing being in lockdown we can't quite you know see each other but thank god we 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 have it better than they did you know, we have virtual, we can, you know, use Zoom, we can use Meet, we can use WhatsApp. We have so many more uh, forms of communicating. But they couldn't see each other, but in their heart, they were having this longing. In verse 3, in verse 6, it, it says two things that brought untold joy to Paul from Timothy's report. The first thing was that their faith, it says no one was unsettled by these trials. See, they, were, they have uh, persecution. For us, we have a pandemic, but pandemic or persecution, it doesn't stop the gospel of Christ. It says your faith that was so much, they had the right focus on God, not on issues and the problems. The other thing was their love. It says they had pleasant memories of, of, of the disciples, that they longed to see each other. It was a right attitude towards the saint. And the final thing was just more, as he closed here, he says, their love for mission. You are standing firm in the Lord, having a right stance towards Jesus, so that whether we are going through persecution or we're going through a pandemic, lockdown or no lockdown, riots in the street, God is looking to us to keep our focus on the mission of Jesus Christ, of loving people, of helping people, find a relationship with their living God. You know, Paul's men's desire from the passage and prayer for the Thessalonians, it says that God would make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else. And the second is that God will strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy. See, here's the thing. From this prayer and desire of Paul, that is what our title is based on. And it's for us in whatever situation we find ourselves that we need to really allow our hearts and our love to increase and overflow. See, when it talks about this, uh, our love increasing and overflowing, this implies that it's a love that is inclusive. It's not restricted. Love that is unlimited in any way. See, the world's concept of love is to love only a few people in a really special way. You know, this gives way to exclusive love, to jealousy, 
and to possessiveness. And that is not the way of God. See, one of the greatest hindrances to love is absence of peace. You know, in the, where there is no peace, where there is hostility, discontentment, harassment, when there is anger, frustration, unforgiveness, revenge, bitterness, love can never grow. And bearing that in mind, when we look and love like God does love, we will find that we are capable of loving not only a few people, but many more people. But not just that, but also we can love more and more deeply. For us today, we must, God is calling us to love, to let our love grow. Otherwise, it will become stale and die. So two keys I just want to draw from this passage to help us in increasing and abounding in love. The first thing is we need to foster the atmosphere, atmosphere of peace. Second, we need to embrace the attitude and actions of encouragement. You see, if we can do these two things, then we create the environment that really allow our love to grow in a powerful way. So the first point is atmosphere of peace. Peace is the fertilizer for love. It provides a fertile ground on which love can really grow and thrive. That is, as we see in our world today, our world is full of sin and strife. But here, things you know, that we do that steal our peace and leave us incapable of loving, many things that we engage ourselves in is, number one, is worries. Worries steal our peace. Instead of being at peace, we are anxious. Self-focus is another thing. Injustice is another thing that steals our peace. We cannot be settled. Fear, negative thoughts. And we've got to really examine our own hearts. How much of my life is involved in these things that steal away peace? Because when our peace goes, then we become paralyzed to really give room to loving. Let's look at a passage that helps, you know, capture the call of God to create an atmosphere of peace. In Romans chapter 12, we'll read from verse 16 to 21. Please turn there, and I would I really encourage all of us to really look in our Bible, and because it's the Bible that is, is what God uses to speak deep into our hearts. So in Romans chapter 12, verse 16 to 21, we read, Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, Give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You know, this passage is really homing in to capture the fact that we must be at peace and live in harmony, not being judgmental. We are called to create an atmosphere and choose actions that will put peace back into each other's lives rather than escalating tension and strife. I want to ask you today, how are you really doing in this area? Do you fuel tension and rage or do you really promote peace, the atmosphere on which love can really thrive? See, promo, it, it, this is something that we see in our city now that so many people haven't seen what happened to uh, uh, George Floyd. All our own experiences of 
racism and prejudice and injustice has really been, you know, boiled up. And so many people are just reacting out of feeling. God is calling us here. Do not overcome evil by evil. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Love is the answer. You know, just like many, I personally have experienced racism in an incredible way. Even as a young age, as less than seven years old, I, I was being raised in the village in Nigeria when we were having uh, a civil war, as many uh, uh, know, the Biafran War. My village is Asaba. Well, village is now city, is now a, a, a state capital. But right there at that young age, every man in the, in the town was gathered together and basically killed. It was total annihilation, all because you didn't belong to the a tribe, every male. And the thing is, then growing up before that day, when you saw, you know, when, when people died and they're, they're taking a, a, a body to the mortuary, our parents would be hiding us from seeing it. But from that day, there were dead bodies everywhere on the street. And so growing up with that kind of, you know, what, why? All the male of that, of age group, or from, uh, you know, the age of 13 to, uh, to, to the grandparents were all killed. Then later, God walked it out for me to come to England. And then I entering England, I'm now known as the monkey. And I was also short. So it's like, wow. It's like because you're in Africa, you speak all this, you know, uh, uh, speak with an accent. And, you know, that made me make a vow. I am not going to change my accent. When I speak, you will know I am an African. I am a Nigerian. But it's all racism. And I grew up just boiling with it. And it's like there is no peace. I felt it's like a siege. Then by the time I, I went to school, it was also war. I had to fight to really survive school. By the time I leave in secondary school, I was asked what sort of job I wanted to do. And I said, I want to be a doctor like any other African, a doctor, engineer, you know, a lawyer. The career officer told me that I'm not even taking any exams. So I'm just dreaming that I, if I want to do woodwork or anything, then they can help me. I left there feeling, whoa, why? But, you know, that drove me that, you know, to make a vow, whatever degree it takes to get, you know, be, be what I want to be, I'm going to get it. But I was fueled with all kinds of reacting to all kinds of racism and injustice. But, you know, when I became a disciple, God began to walk in my heart. And even walking in the church in the first place, it was just a few People, all white people, only a few black here and there, you know, in my mind, as soon as I walk into a group, I figure out hey, how many black people are in this place. That's how my own heart, I was racist. And so even as the brothers were reaching out to me, they tried to hug me. I said, where is that coming from? And I studied the Bible, convicted, became a disciple, but it's like I grew up. Being taught you don't trust strangers, and especially if they're not from your tribe, even though you're from your, your, the same, uh, uh, they're not the black people or white people or this. But you see, all that fuels so much anger, distrust. But in Christ, we can't change. You know, I am so grateful that through all the people God put in my life, I can learn to love and my love is doesn't only flow to black, white or pink or short or tall people. But our love needs to overflow to all people. You know, part of it is let harmony live. But also God calls us that we need to build up each other as part of it. In First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 11, it says, therefore, encourage one another and build up each other just as in fact you are doing. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, as Paul writes the second letter in verse 3, he says, We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, 
and the love all of you have for each other is increasing. It's amazing that in this church in Thessalonica, that the people, their, their love for each other is not just st staying static. Even under persecution, they were growing in love, loving one another, and it's overflowing, increasing to other people. We need to let our love overflow beyond the boundaries of our own home, beyond the boundaries of our fellowship. It's not just our love for each other, disciples growing, but also to the lost. The Great Commission calls us to go make new friends, all nations. I want to ask you, look among the friends that you have. Are they of the same race? Then there's something wrong. That is the joy that when we come as a church, if you look around, there are people of all different races. It's like countries, everything, because Christ's love breaks all barriers. There is no clique in God's kingdom. We are called to be peacemakers, not, peace, not just peacekeepers. Joining groups and, uh, you know, different uh, factions and groups that who have their own agenda is not the way of God. We need to individually make peace for our God is a peacemaker. So I want to urge us, let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. Even we can grow in this peace and be a peacemaker, even while living in a world that is full of sin and strife. Our second point attitude and action of encouragement see encouragement means to put courage back into other people the things that we read these days and we see on the news and experience in our world today it tends tends to take courage away from us but if love is going to grow we need to be intentional to put back courage in in each other Let's go to Colossians chapter 3 as God helps us to really get a, a, you know, get a, a handle on what it would take to be able to embrace this attitude and action of encouragement. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 3 and we'll read from verse uh, 9. And so, from verse 9 to 15 it reads, Do not lie to each other. Since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge, in the image of his creator. Here, there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarians, Scythians, slaves or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, Holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. You know, before we re read on from verse 16, what we're seeing here is that if love is going to thrive, we are being called to put off falsehood, to speak truthfully, but then bear with each other and forgive as Christ did. See, without speaking the truth to each other, then we're not representing God. We're not creating an atmosphere to, that will promote love. As I shared earlier, I was brought up just to, you know, it's like you can't trust anybody but yourself because of all the things I've seen that Christ calls us to really speak truthfully. I am so glad for the relationship we all have in the body that we can speak as plainly as possible. I thank God for people who have said things that nobody else ever said in my said to me in my life when they have seen it glaring, but they speak the truth to help me be who I need to be. For our friends who are visiting 
Uh, and we really want to urge you that, yes, please talk to the people who invited you. Let's open the Bible. We want to speak to you. We're not perfect, but we want to help you find God who can heal all the wounds. The way we respond to all kinds of injustice that we've been through, that things have enslaved our life, is to speak truthfully. And then to really be able to carry each other's burden and look to Christ to forgive our sins. Let's continue in, in verse 16. It says, let the me uh, 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 let me turn. Yeah, it says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your heart. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You know, the thing that keep, you know, we, we keep hearing from God again and again from all these passages, the need for gratitude, the need to be giving thanks. When we give ourselves wholly to what God teaches, we will see the fruits of it and gratitude will overflow. Even as a church, what God has done for us during this pandemic period, we prayed. Many of us caught the COVID and it's like we recovered. Though many lost their dear ones and, and they're finding healing because we mourn with those who mourn and we rejoice with those who rejoice. We've seen God do miracles, transform people's lives. People becoming transformed from darkness into light. People becoming Christians, having so much joy in the midst of all this lockdown. That is the work of God. But here it says, let the words of Christ dwell as we teach and admonish one another. That is what we call discipling relationships. That we must give our heart to discipling relationship because that is God's plan to be able to, you know, walk inside of us. God used discipling relationship to walk in all my baggages that I brought into the kingdom. And I thank God for people that persevered with me. They really believed in me. And many of them believing in me and giving courage to me was actually addressing issues that were hindrance, like pride. Like, ha you know, it's like having no regard for honor, being conceited. I only associate with different people. And I'm very grateful for people that never kept, you know, never stopped believing in me and giving their heart. We are called here not to treat fellow disciples in, the, in our discipling relationship, in, in just fulfilling the, the, all the righteousness. You know, I want to ask you, in your people you are discipling, is it just a tick box we've discipled them? Or do you genuinely love and show concern in all aspects of their life? We are called here not to treat people that we are studying the Bible as just studies but to treat them as friends with genuine love that we don't give up on people and we give our hearts. We've got to ask ourselves, are you giving your all, all your heart in the discipling relationship you have to the people who are discipling us? I am very grateful for Mohan being in my life. I've learned so much. And uh, it, it's... It's like we grew up together, you know, as disciples in the early days. In the, we were both baptized in 83. But he went to India, I went to Africa, and then we come back here. And, and as God has worked it out, he's discipling me. I have so much to learn from him. And I'm so grateful for all the help and the support he's been with to me as I lead the North London church, uh, region. And I pray that we can really appreciate the people God has put in our own life, to really walk, to love them, and to pour our life into them. See, one of the things is uh, just uh, uh, this past weekend, oh, well, that's last, uh, last week, uh, there's a group of uh, young men that I've been working with, we call ourselves warriors. Yeah, I'm a warrior, even though, you know, some of them are in their uh, 20s, I mean, uh, <clears throat> 50 plus. But you see, we gather, there are six of us, and for now, we'll be meeting every week for over three years. And to see them and working with each other, 
this past uh, uh, Tuesday we met and we're now doing a, a half year review. Having gone past, uh, you know, it's like the first five months, how have we done with the goals we set before God? And then how, what are we looking forward to the next seven months? And when we share what we think, and then each of the other dis uh, uh, disciples, warriors, will give you input what they've seen in you and, uh, and, and how they've seen you change or so, and then what they want to see you cha uh, change in the next coming. But when we had this time, it was such an encouraging time because every single one of them, well, you know, we left there so encouraged because we have been in each other's lives. So we're able to see how much they have grown, they changed, and, and they become different things. And, you know, Daniel Marie, who is now a, a, a hired to be an intern, is one of them. Uh, Yinka Duwale, that some of, of you may know, is, is one of them. And we even have married people in the, in the group, in uh, uh, Carlton and Eno. Uh, Carlton is a warrior, not Eno. And then we also have um, Anthony, who is basically helping with Chief Usher. Anthony Ademosu, who helps coordinate ushering in the whole church. But also we have, uh, along with it, Rob Kanzira. A lot of these young men have done one year challenge and, and now are spearheading different ministries. You know, it's such a joy to be together and, and just be inspired by their faith. But it's love that glues us together. You know, we give courage to one another. I want to ask us today, you know, with love, as the Bible says, we will never fail. Although we may never, we may disappoint each other. We will, we will make mistakes in our relationship with one another. But we must persevere. We must walk at it and grow in our love for each other. Yes, all of us, we are going through this uh, uh, lockdown, physical lockdown, but we can actually sometimes allow it to become, uh, you know, a mental or spiritual lockdown, which is a very sad thing. We cannot allow the lockdown physical to translate into spiritual lockdown. So I want to ask you, how are you engaging with one another? Are you isolating yourself? or actively engaging with everybody. You know, a couple of people we had to uh, chat uh, ch ch chat to because uh, when they come on the Zoom, we use Zoom platform for uh, our services. Some come and it's like you put a blanket over over yourself. It's like, no, we, we don't even see each other to hug, but at least to see each other's face is encouraging. We come to uh, uh, meetings not to, to take only, but to give. Even give a smile helps. I want us to remind ourselves about people who have actually isolated themselves and then fell into all kinds of sin. We, we know about King David. He isolated himself during a time of war when basically uh, uh, all, the, all the men were going to war. He chose to stay behind and that gave made him go uh, give in to the bait that Satan had. Judas isolated himself in his thoughts, not sharing his temptation and what was going through his mind with other disciples. He went alone to attend secret meetings to try and make peace, sort of, and ended up betraying Jesus. It is not time to, uh, to basically take a spiritual holiday. It is a time to engage like never before, to really build each other up, to teach, admonish, and put courage in each other. I want to encourage you today to take time to call other, others to see how they are doing, especially those who don't belong to, you know, uh, that you regularly see or are part of your family group. Let's open our eyes and really reach out to one another. But that, let that love overflow to other people that God wants to bring into his kingdom. Please, let's get involved to really bring people from darkness to light. And let's get involved to help those who are already in the light to grow in their love, that they too can become an oasis of love. As we conclude today, we cannot stay stagnant in our love. We are under obligation to keep, keep on loving one another. Not only fellowship disciples, but all people. Let's all decide today to commit in prayer and action to increase 
and abound in love as our title you know teaches us and let's embrace the two points we've talked about today to foster atmosphere of peace don't fuel tensions but be a peacemaker and proactively build others up secondly let's embrace attitude and action of encouragement let's be intentional to daily put courage into each other may god bless you i hope uh, these things that we've shared today has gone a long way to really encourage us but i do also pray and encourage our friends who are visiting please our god and our plan is to follow god's way to increase our love and i pray that you can open your heart to study the Bible and find out what God's plan for your life is. I don't know all the things that is distracting you. Let's decide to commit to God's way. For God wants to take us into a new realm of love. May God bless you. Thank you once again. Amen. Let's, uh, I think we're going to close out right now. We're going to sing... There's a fountain free, tis for you and me. There's a fountain free, tis for you and me. Let us haste, oh haste to its brink. Tis the fount of love from the source of Church of Christ. Uh, I'm Andy and I'm just going to share about communion and as we come now to take communion we reflect on Jesus and what he did, who he was and we give thanks for his impact on our lives. As we do this it's inevitable in a way that we will reflect on our own lives, on who we are, who we want to be, in effect, our identity. During this time of lockdown, um, I've heard different people talk uh, about how they have enjoyed a slower lifestyle, how they have valued time with their families and loved ones. Others have not been quite so lucky. Uh, maybe they're being anxious or lonely in these times. 
Who are we? What values matter to us? These are big and very important questions. They affect how we feel about ourselves and how others view us really affects us mentally and physically. Many people are treated badly purely because of their sex, their race, their sexuality or even their size or their intelligence. This in a way is a kind of imprisonment because their freedom or even their power to affect the circumstances is very hard to come by. Movements for equality, feminism, LGBT plus rights and the current Black Lives Matter really do matter because it affects who we are, how we see ourselves. We all have unconscious bias and um, recently our company, my company that I work for, um, has given us training on this. We all have it. We all have unconscious bias. It's, we must recognise that it's, it's really a human trait. We grow up a certain way, we learn certain things, we experience certain experiences. And um, there's, there's really a lot of listening, a lot of um, learning to do to overcome some of these things that people get very hurt about uh, through odd comments that people might make through having their own unconscious bias. Last year I was at a talk at work on the, the links between slavery and Glasgow and Scotland as a whole. And uh, yeah, it was very enlightening given by um, uh, um, an ambassador from Jamaica, I think. Even more so with the revelations um, shown about the, the link between slavery and the U and slavery and the ongoing impacts of it in the USA in a podcast called 1619, which I really recommend. But it's important that we share our point of view, share our experience for us to grow as people, as a humanity, if you like, uh, we need to be brave and in sharing these things, but also being um, humble and gentle in our receipt of these opinions and helping each other to, to learn and to unravel the biases that we have. But these, these issues are really important, don't get me wrong, and they deserve our focus and attention. But should they describe or determine who we are? We do not fit into a box. I think we're more interesting than the labels, the boxes that sometimes we put on ourselves or on others. I am male, you may have noticed. I'm white, middle class, if you like, educated, heterosexual and English. Does this make me an oppressor? Does it automatically give me privilege? Maybe. But does this fully define who I am? My daughters are twins and they've been raised identically as far as I'm aware. And yet they approach things very differently. They have different likes and dislikes and they are individuals. We are more than just the labels that people give us. In Galatians chapter three, uh, verse 26, Paul continues his argument against those who want to maintain the old Jewish law and retain superiority and advantage. He says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Paul had already noted how through faith in Christ, and this crops up a lot, we are changed as Christians. In verse 14, he reminds us that we are justified through faith in Christ. In verse 22, we note that we have received the spirit through faith in Christ. 
Now this passage describes how we are now children of God, even heirs, through faith in Christ. How can this be? Well, in Galatians 2 verse 20, Paul states, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. We are changed. We are different. Although our race and our sex remain externally visible, and Paul never says that they don't exist, because these things are part of who we are. It's part of our makeup. It's how we were created to be. We now belong to the tribe of God. Our identity is found in God. We should also we should really allow ourselves to uh, be led by the Spirit within us to, to love each other, to be concerned and compassionate, to help carry one another's burdens. And I believe this change in identity is crucial. If we're not changed, we are guided only by our inherent spirit that we have, desires that lead us to selfishness, to division, and indulgence. This is brought to light by the infamous sin list in Galatians 5, which lit highlights what our desires lead to. Things like hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy. This makes for a bleak future for humanity. Dare I say, history proves this to be very true, very real. As much as society tries to tackle the issues that we face, and it must, it must really try, it will have limited success without the transformation brought about by God in us when we are baptised into Christ as the change, the difference that we have through our faith in Christ. The sacrifice of Jesus and his resurrection has created new life in us. We now know who we are that we belong unified together with God. Let's take communion and remember Jesus' sacrifice, what he has given us. And as we go and pray now, I'm just gonna start from Ezekiel 36 and verse 24. Lord Father God, I thank you so much for all that you have given us. You promised us um, we heard through the prophet Ezekiel, you said, for I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into our own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities, from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Lord, we thank you just for the, the promise that you fulfilled through your son, Jesus. We thank you that we are changed as human beings, that we can move on from the fears, the, the sort of dissensions, the, the desire to be selfish, God, if we can just let you, your spirit, God within us, change us and lead us. We thank you, Lord Father God, that you have put this into our hearts, that through your presence on earth, through your sacrifice, that you have given us a pathway. You have enabled us to be justified, to be you know, reinstated back into our right relationship with you, Father. We thank you that we are changed as people. I pray, Lord Father God, that you can help us to as I say, to, to follow your spirit, <clears throat> to be different in this world, to show love, to be the loving face of you, your ambassadors on this earth. We thank you and we praise you through your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks for your time. Soul, soul, my soul, soul, my soul, 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 so
So. Oh.